through my screen here, we are going to make it very interactive and you're going to leave here with over 20 tips that you can use to either personally start collaborating or getting your teams to do the same. So Gail, I'm going to give it a shot right now to share my screen here. Hold on one sec, everybody. There we go. Hey, Gail, you want to give me a thumbs up here if you can see my screen? Good. Fantastic. Okay, everybody, what I want to do is focus on making the best of your time. Time is a non-renewable resource. It's the one thing that we can't get back. So it's my job to make you engaged and worth it. So here's what we're gonna do. We are actually gonna use something called Menti, Mentimeter today. Everyone here, if you have your phone, could you do me a favor and go to menti.com? Just type that in, open a browser, go to menti.com. And pretty soon I'm gonna show you a code that's gonna let you interact live in real time with everyone else. If you don't have a phone, get a pen and paper, you're gonna be able to write down just as much good stuff, even if you don't have that phone with you. So diving in here, let's throw out a question. I'd like to understand from you, how well do you think your employees have adapted to working remotely? Either your employees or the team you work on. Enter the code there that's in the top of your screen, 11, 13, 82, that's 802, and enter in your vote. How well have your employees, or if you don't have employees and you're part of a team, adapted to working remotely? Not well, pretty well, very well, better than ever. What I love about Mentimeter is it's real time. It's super cool. I did this actually with some of my clients at Novartis last week with a thousand people. Fascinating, so fascinating. Okay, so directionally here, and I know we still have votes coming in, everyone's saying very well. Well, you wouldn't be here unless you wanted to improve it and everyone was working better than ever. So let's get you ways to do that. By the way, all the data that you get here today and that you interact with, I'll be sending Gail to you and your team later and you can distribute to everybody just so they have it. Okay, we're gonna talk about four things quickly. First of all, I wanna help you normalize being virtual because that's not going away. You will be hybrid at best in the future, at least through 2021. We're gonna set norms. Most people have not set norms, even though they think they are unspoken, they are not. We're gonna to use tools and tech. Remember, tech is not a collaboration strategy, tools are. And then finally, I want to help you with collaboration overload, which is probably going to be your favorite part. So let's start. First of all, let's normalize being virtual. And I think what I mean by that is what are the norms and things that we have to set in place and how can we get people really engaged? Because what they really miss is the informal connections and they're trying to find virtual common ground. What we're finding with a lot of teams now, especially as they're getting a little burned out um, and to be quite honest, there's a depression issue that's happening because people are getting a little, uh, it's not that they're not productive, they're just a little overwhelmed. Um, what we had in terms of norms and sense of trust in the real in-person world has now shifted and we have to reestablish it. There's a trust issue. So how can we make sure that that informal, right, nonverbal type of stuff still happens even if we're just alone sitting at our desk? So the first thing that might seem obvious is I really wanna strongly encourage people to make using video the norm. And the reason why is when we were in the real world, right, all working together, you didn't come into a conference room and have half the people sitting at the desk and the other half under it. So you wanna make sure that you have a norm where you have everybody on camera or not. The reason I wanna talk about having people on video is because of this. Audio is passive, video is active. Video allows you to have nonverbals, to get that sense of trust, to be able to see people, and see yourselves, which is really great, especially when you're talking about difficult, challenging things. We know when people actually are on video, they are 27% more engaged than when they are not. It's, first of all, they're not allowed to multitask as much, right? It's bad form. And also it makes them more engaged because they're looking at other things and they're looking at themselves. There was really great social psychology research that was done in Chicago my hometown, and they did it in bars, these social psychologists. And what they found was very interesting in terms of people's behavior. 
people behaved better in the bars where there was a mirror right at the back of the bar behind the bartender. The reason why was this. Well, first of all, the results were people were better behaved. They were more polite. They ordered more. They were more patient with the bartender and they were less drunk, which is great for most of our meetings, by the way, because they not only um, could see how they were, um, uh, they were interacting among people, but they saw their own behavior in the mirror. And that's what video does too. When we're on a conference call, half the time we're looking at our team, the other half we're looking at ourselves. So being able to do that and making it a norm is very important for many social reasons. The other thing we wanna do besides just using video is getting people comfortable with their space. You know, I, I live in New York City, actually just outside of it. I have a home, I have a lot of different places, my own office that I could sit and have a really great conference call. A lot of your team might not, and they might feel very awkward about having to have a conference call in their bedroom, right? It's kind of weird. So how do we normalize that? I have a really good friend at Fidelity that gave me some advice around giving people garden walks. They give um, field trips of their own homes. He places stuff on his back wall that are conversation pieces so people can get to know him more personally. Because if we don't have those informal interactions anymore, we have to create them for others and make our homes more normal. He also does some fun things which you guys have probably done, which is every Friday, they come up with the craziest background they can come up with. He's also sent swag to his team that they have different virtual parties or ways to rally around and build a, a cohesive culture. Those things seem silly, but they're not because we're trying to build trust. Okay, that's number one, normalizing being virtual. Number two, what are those norms that we need to set around being virtual? I would bet if I did a survey right now and I said, how many of you have articulated explicit norms around how you'll communicate while working remotely? Most of you would have to say you don't have them. You think you do because they're assumed, but you don't have them explicit. Let me give you some hints of what you should do in terms of putting out guidelines or even mandates for people so we all behave the same way. The first thing is, how do we wanna tell people when to use email versus meetings versus the phone, right? We're all zoomed out, what are you gonna do about it? Right, I run a simplification and innovation business. My team is small, we're zoomed out. So first of all, think about email is for information, meetings are for decisions, Phone calls are for quick, informal interactions. How can you shake up your communication style to embrace all of those? I also wanna encourage people now to get more focused with your meetings. How can you change using your agendas to be more hard hitting and specific? One of the things we recommend and have seen our clients uh, like at Pfizer and Novartis do is rather than saying what the subject is in the subject line, put the question in the subject line that you're trying to answer. That gets people focused up and it makes you really um, think about what are you trying to accomplish in a meeting, right? So making a question, not just a subject. Also putting guidelines down for defaults for standard meetings. Not every meeting, not every strategy meeting versus status meeting, but in general, because everyone likes to argue with me that you can't have one set standard meeting. I would try and make 30 is the new 60, 15 is the new 30. So if you can make 30 minute your default, go for it, right? Change the frequency. The other thing I would say to people is you've got to change your language because everything has become background noise. I really don't pay attention when people talk to next steps anymore. It's, I'd rather have somebody say, what were the decisions that we just made? Because that makes accountability and make sure that we're all aligned before we get off a call. Okay, that's the second thing. Now let's move to the third. Pick up your pencils, get ready to interact because this is where I'm really gonna give you some great personal strategies you can use. Okay, one of the things I want you to think about is most meetings are horrible, right? It, it, it hasn't really changed since we went from in-person to remote, they still suck. So here's what, something really interesting. Here's the arc of a typical meeting from a manpower study that was done. Over the course of about 60 minutes, it starts with really high interest and quickly in less than 10 minutes, it falls off a cliff every time. We're excited, this meeting's gonna accomplish something. Oh, no, it's not, this one sucks too. And it only goes back up at the end because we're excited the meeting's almost over. What you really want from someone running a meeting or frankly from a really good keynote presenter is you can't do the same thing you used to do on stage. You've got to interact and reset constantly. It's about resets. So every five minutes, 
And this isn't just entertainment, you have to engage. And how we're gonna do that is in some really interesting ways. Let me show you how. First of all, I'm gonna ask you a question. Why don't you tell me, how do you right now effectively or creatively engage with your teams remotely? Just give me an answer. Is it, I don't know, no meetings Friday. You have crazy hat Wednesday. You guys have virtual cocktail parties. Share with your peers here, what are some cool things you do to help people better engage and collaborate remotely? I'm gonna enter in mine right now too. We share pics of our pets. Hey, here's a funny one I heard from uh, someone last week. Um, everyone had to run into the cupboard and share the, um, a picture of their most expired food <laughs> that they had in their pantry, which I thought was pretty good. Pictures of our pets, what else do you have? Let's keep going. Virtual happy hours, that's another good one. Icebreakers, I love. I was on a cool call that had a chef and I prepared a meal. Oh, I love it, that's fantastic. So these are some kind of episodic and fun ways we can get going. But how can we do that on an ongoing basis with things that also are serious? Start the meeting with positive personal exemplars, that's great. 25 or 50 minutes so you can allow for breaks, very productive. I'm gonna show you some of mine. Now, I'm gonna give you about 20. 20 ways you can do this. Your goal is to only try one, not all of them, one. Here we go. First of all, let's start with participation. We need to start better using the technology that we have. So what you can do is get people hand raising for agreements, emoticons for feelings, chat is for ideas. By the way, chat is very important for people that are introverted. It's a very good diversity tool and inclusion tool polling to drive decisions, and even using the platform I'm using today, Mentimeter, which is gonna give us things to do word clouds and a whole bunch of other things. You can also personalize. One of the things that they do at Fidelity is that they have their leaders, um, they're each in charge each month to have a virtual cup of coffee, 15 minutes only, with each person on their team to connect with them in an informal fashion. Have a non-working lunch, Another one that I really like to personalize is um, reaching across the organization and have a 15 minute brain date with somebody that has a role that you don't know about or would like to partner with. The other thing I like, which somebody mentioned here, which was great, is introducing an icebreaker or skill builder, but my general suggestion is to do it at the end of your meeting. Because we waste a lot of time right now in 30 minute meetings on icebreakers, it's better to save this time at the end and end it on an up note. Finally, to activate your meetings. Remember, tech is not a strategy, it's a tool. What would be really cool is you can do like some of my clients at HBO, they have guest appearances for KDs, knowledge drops. So they'll bring someone in to do a knowledge drop for five minutes on a topic like AI or blockchain or collaboration at the beginning of a meeting, just to get a little kind of brain juice going. Using your breakout rooms, very good for people that like to work in small groups and wanna collaborate. And another thing I would encourage people is rather than having these free for all brainstorms or status meetings, run a specific challenge with a specific tool to get a specific challenge or problem solved. Let me give you an example. So one of the things that we like to do is we use a tool called impossible to possible. In advance, you tell people what the challenge is you're trying to solve. Uh, it'll never be possible for us to, I don't know, come up with a product remotely and you list individually, all the things that are impossible and why that thing can't happen. You then are in charge of exchanging your impossibles with another person on your team. They have to solve the impossibles and make them possible. And then you get on a team meeting and everyone presents the possibles that they came up with. The reason for doing this is called cognitive distance. We are better at solving other people's problems and getting further away from our own. So tools are fantastic. Only a couple more things here. And I wanna end with this last bit of advice, avoiding collaboration overload. This is probably the biggest one that we have an issue with right now. And I want you to think about how you can do less and more meaningful. So here's this, 
First of all, you can follow in the footsteps of Cleveland Clinic mini meetings. What they did is they said, look, we can't get rid of meetings. And it doesn't do us any good to have a meeting only or meeting free Friday. Why don't we just have smaller agile meetings? And they do five minute sprints every morning and call it a day. Next is having 30s, the new 60. Another one is doing a meeting audit. I would recommend to everybody to declare bankrupt, uh, meeting bankruptcy, get rid of all your meetings on your calendar, audit all the ones that you do weekly, monthly, annually, and convince each other why that should go back on the calendar. Sprint did this and they got rid of 18% of their meetings. Set meeting only days rather than meeting free days. Why do we only have one day a week that's meeting free? Why don't we just have one day a week where we have meetings? And then finally, two other uh, suggestions I have for people is doing drop-off meetings. It's a much better way to get everybody involved on the biggest topics at the start. And then like a carpool, people drop off at each stage as they're needed less. The best companies I know also do something called uninvite. They uninvite people to meetings because their time is too important. You're not invited, don't worry about it. So now I wanna ask all of you, we just normalized, we wanted to set norms, we wanted to use tools for engagement, and we wanna now stop doing things. My question for you is, which tip here do you wanna try first? I'm gonna give you one last word bubble. Which tip will you try first? And type that in for me now. Hold on, I'm just plugging in my computer, everybody. Okay, which tip will you try first? Let's type it in now. Which tip will you try first? All right, here they come. Drop off meetings, meeting only days. I love it. That's great. Anyone else? What else will you try first? Meeting audit, fantastic. Good. Meeting only days, love it. Keep going. Let's see what else we got. Drop off meetings, good. I love it. Okay, great. Keep going. 30 is the new 60. Emoticons for feelings. Thank you. Challenges to solve. Well, it looks like meeting only days is becoming the front runner, Gail, here. This is pretty interesting. Good. Drop off meetings. Excellent. Emoticons for feelings. Excellent. Okay. So this is interesting. Clearly what I would say with this group, or if I was doing this with a client, meetings obviously are the issues and we wanna be able to get rid of them. And I'll be sending this to everybody. Well, here's what I wanna to say to everyone here. How can I help you better collaborate and work more remotely based on this presentation? I'd love you now to enter in any questions or comments and I'll take some questions, Gail, if that's okay now on this topic. How can we start getting better in terms of not meeting, but collaborating and what kind of questions do you have for me around these tools? I hope this is showing you that there's lots of things that you can do on your own and with your team to make your meetings better. So Lisa, we did have a question come in um, prior to the meeting today from one of our clients. And her question was, how do you get people to stop ideating and solving problems through email and Slack and recognizing the need to have more human connection even if we're all working remotely. Human connection is a really good point. And that gets back to that thing of fear now. People have our um, fear and trust, I should say. And the thing about that is we have to just recognize the types of meetings that we're having. If you wanna actually collaborate and build things, that's not really not something that's done on email or a chat, right? That's kind of just an iterative process. If you really wanna have people be able to build things together, that's where you have something like I said, like uh, running a challenge, using a tool or using some kind of polling to get everybody to come together. That's how I would answer that. Uh, let's do this next one. How can we encourage our teams to have meeting only days? So I wouldn't go cold turkey and be very black and white to say that we can only have meetings on one day because it's not realistic. I would ask people, what you're trying to do is reduce the frequency. So can we only have meetings towards the beginning of the week or the end of the week? What's better for everybody? Mondays and Tuesdays or just Thursdays and Fridays? That's one way to go. Another way to do it is <clears throat> only have them in the mornings or only have them in the afternoons. So for example, at FutureThink, we only have meetings that are after three o'clock if they're internal meetings, so we can have the first part of our day to get things done. 
So there's lots of ways to look at it. You don't have to be too extreme to get people on board and eventually they'll be able to stretch a little bit more, which is great. Gail, I got another one here actually in terms of collaboration. Okay. What, are, uh, what are examples of other tools you have to run challenges? So an, another one that we always love too is if you can't get people to um, come up with more ideas, one thing you can do is actually uh, get rid of things. And we do something called kill a stupid rule. And something that's really fun is they take 30 minutes. You use a chat feature like this and you ask people to give you all the rules that they think are holding them back from having time to be more innovative or do more productive work. They will come up with dozens in less than half an hour and you can kill some right away to get some time back. I've had another one here. Our clients in the past and that, that's always a winner. I know, <laughs> everyone always laughs, like killing a stupid rule is such an easy thing, but it's, it's literally a game changer and it, it costs you nothing. It, you just ask people for advice. What would you consider the sweet spot for length of meetings and number of meetings in a day? I'm not gonna be able to answer number of meetings, but sweet spot right now, I think is about 30 minutes. And the reason for that is because our, um, our level of ADD has accelerated significantly because we spend so much more time in front of our screen and we don't get up as much. So the thing I would say is, first of all, shorten your meetings to 30 minutes. But the other thing I would say is don't make everything about being in front of your screen. Also use email and use your phone. Uh, let me see. I'd like to kill some useless metrics. That's fantastic. You know what they say, you can kill stupid rules. You just can't kill stupid people. That's the only thing you're not allowed to do. <laughs> okay. How do we engage introverts who are enjoying working from home without overwhelming them? Um, this is interesting. One of the things that I really like, I am more of an extrovert than an introvert. And I love working from home. What they talk about in terms of the future of work, is that working from home is gonna be where people have their tactical heads down time. This is where we get either rote work done or very deep work done. And in the future going into the office is gonna be where we get our collaborative innovative work done. So imagine by the way, that when you go into the office, everything is designed in the future like an innovation lab. And at home is where we get what used to be the old work done. So how do we encourage introverts who are enjoying working from home? A few things. One is making sure that you give them ways that they can participate in small group work. Too many people get on a call and they just ask people to shout out answers and the introverts automatically go into their shell. So you need to have tools like this with Menti, polls, chats, et cetera, where people can be heard without being verbal. The other thing is doing small groups and breakouts where people can feel safer before you bring them back to a bigger group. Fantastic. And I just got one more, sorry, one of the chat. Um, an example of an icebreaker that people like. I have so many. I have so many, Gail. We, that could be a whole nother topic that we do. One that I really like right now is called That's Fantastic. And the reason this is great, this is a good skill builder that you can do because it moves people from problems to possibilities. And it goes like this. You match people up. Someone's the CEO and someone's the employee. The employee has to actually come to the CEO and they can only bring problems. And the CEO can only answer to those outrageous problems by saying that's fantastic and figure out a way to make it a really good thing. You can do a, a real problem at work or you can do a hypothetical. I'll give you a hypothetical because that's what warms people up. So for example, let's say um, Gail, you are um, the CEO of a bowling alley and I am your employee. And I would come to you and I would say, Gail, I've got some really bad news. We no longer can use bowling balls. And that's Gail, you would, right, that's fantastic. But you would have to answer with like, that's fantastic. You know what? I've always wanted to reinvent this game. And this is gonna force us to come up with a virtual video game that doesn't involve a bowling alley or bowling pins. This is the best thing that's ever happened to us. So using this kind of that's fantastic as a skill builder or icebreaker, will help people get more agile and positive when they're not just using it, you know, like in a real world technique. Lisa, I've also heard you talk about mini mindsets. Yes. Talk a little mini, bit about that. Yeah, mini mindsets, you know, I was talking about how we all have ADD 
And what's really interesting about it is I think that people now um, accelerated learning is much more of a thing. We don't have time for full day training. It's very hard for people to attend full day events. So the more accelerated we can be, 30 is the new 60, 15 is the new 30, the more people will be engaged. The other thing about a mini mindset is making sure that um, you're using people's time to be more productive. So whereas in the past we got a lot of theory, I think now people need to actually move to solutions more quickly. So to me with the mini mindset is rather than trying to teach them five things, we're gonna focus on one skill, one tool and one minute. So that's what we're trying to do is we're not just trying to compress, but we're trying to be more focused. So Lisa, can you talk just a little bit about this tool that people may have experienced for the first time today? The attendees log on to Mentee. But as the presenter, are you on Mentimeter? I am. Yeah, I use Mentimeter as an interactive platform for all the presentations that I give virtually because I think because everyone, oh, that's my dog, everybody. I think everybody has um, ADD and I think what they want to do is have some more interactivity. So Mentimeter, you put your PowerPoint presentations into it and then you get interactivity and you can choose the different templates that you want. And um, they can do from Word Cloud from polling to awards, you can do um, game shows, all kinds of things. And you have to have a subscription, but it's just one of many things. The, the future is Zoom and Teams are platforms. What I'm showing you here are interactive tools to get audiences engaged. So what used to work on stage where people could just talk to people, we have to be much more engaged and think about how we can get everyone collaborating even while we're presenting. Perfect. Oh my gosh, you've given me so many ideas. I love it. And Fantastic. what we do this week is what we've done in the past, and that is honor those of you who scheduled only 30 minutes and give you an opportunity to drop off a new term I, I learned today. <laughs> any of you who plan events that want to stay on, Lisa's going to hang behind for after the show where she's gonna share some fundamental best practices, things she's seeing work and planning, not so much meetings like we talked about today, but actually virtual events. So if you wanna stay on for that, you know, it's just gonna be a few more minutes. In addition to that, we'll be doing this again, live with GBA on October 12th with Kurt Steinhorst. And Kurt is really great. Um, he's a person who has battled with ADD personally and professionally. And he really focuses on uh, attention distractors. So it'll, it'll be a nice thing to come right behind Lisa, I think, uh, dealing with people that are struggling with um, their focus and how to keep it during this time when we're all working remotely. So thank you to everybody that joined us. And for those of you that want to stay behind, you know, the question I always like to lead with Lisa is, what are the best practices you're seeing that are working when corporations or organizations are planning virtual events? So I, I'm really glad that you said that. I think one of the issues with virtual events right now is people think that it's just having another Zoom presentation. I think a few things. One is um, making it multimedia. So doing something like this in terms of interactivity is an absolute must. I think making sure that you have a presenter that understands with people you need to work with large and small groups. I think the other thing about the presentations right now is they need to move quite quickly from theory to practice. I do see a lot of um, impatience and fear from people and they want to be able to know how to get things done because they feel alone. Remember, they're at home alone. They're not with their teams anymore. So if you can have a presentation or an event that really gives people some practical ways to collaborate with others, I think that's going to be a big thing too. The other thing with events is I think they've got to rethink what used to be an hour keynote. And I would really think about having 15 and 30 minute presentations. Um, people want fast action and they're having a hard time sitting on their butts for a long time. So the more creative you can be about that, the better. Okay, great. Um, any pitfalls that planners should avoid? I mean, I guess in a way you address those, but any others you can think of? Yeah, I really think one of the things that I like about what you said is, well, one, not planning it too long. Two, not having, you know, missing out on the interactivity. If it doesn't have interactive and interactivity in the presentation, people will tune out. I think having things that people can take away from it after is also very important. So I want to be able to just watch it, but then if I can get a copy of it or recording of it or something right after, like here, like the, the word cloud, that would be really helpful and important to me too. I want to put you on the spot, but are you willing to meet with clients to, to give your input or understanding what it is they're trying to accomplish and then maybe offering like, oh, I've seen this over here, I've seen that over there, or why don't we do this? Do you, do you collaborate 
with the event planner to put it together in the best way possible. Yes, we do. That's, and I thank you for asking it. One of the things that we'll say is, you know, if it's a small group, we'll have much more, um, for example, if this was only eight or 10 people, I would have had everybody on camera and we would have had more live discussion because it would have been easier to interact that way. For large groups of a thousand plus, like I did with uh, Novartis, I would have used a lot more of this interactivity so I could bring everybody into the conversation as well as introverts and be more inclusive. So group size has a lot to do with it. It also depends on the topic. So for example, one of the topics that I talk about is called the Great Reset. And that's what this really is right now is how people are feeling and resetting their businesses during COVID. That is a very, um, there's a lot of psychology to that and catharsis in terms of how people are feeling. So I make sure that I give people time to be able to voice because I think a lot of it is a little bit like a mini therapy session. Yeah. Right, so if we have to take into account not just the usual logistics, but frankly more the feelings of people because right now the idea is how do you build trust? How do you get rid of fear? And how do you make people feel less isolated and burned out? Wow. It's a big ask, but I do think it has been fun for all of us to come together to try to invent, reinvent what, what the gold standard is. And, and I would love to, you know, I'd be interested to hear from other people in the chat, but two things that cross my mind. If you're, if we're remote, obviously it's about, you know, really taking into account um, uh, the interactivity and the group size in terms of the platform that you use. However, I don't think that's gonna go away. And in the future, it's gonna be hybrid. So I can imagine myself being on stage, but having to do a very similar thing here with the remote group. That was happening already. Now the good news, frankly, is just more accelerated. And for the people that are on here that are, are, are not in the speaking world, but they're the clients. That's good news for you because you get skill and a lot more ROI to be quite honest. And with the remote stuff like I'm doing here today with Mentimeter, you also get IP that comes out of it. You know, when I speak on stage and you take some surveys, it just kind of goes into the ether. But when we have remote stuff here, you're actually capturing data and rules and feedback that you can use for further events. So I think that's actually even more productive. Um, and, and, and I just think it's gonna be better for you to have data in the future so people will be more engaged with events. The, the last thing I'll say, Gail, is I think in the future too, events are gonna be a lot more special because the ability for people to travel, um, it's gonna be a big thing for people to spend money on that. And when they do get together, the ability to interact with people is just, it will have been so rare because we haven't done it for so long. It'll be almost like a VIP thing. So I think how we then manage those events of versus having a thousand salespeople in a room that I don't know, hit club level and we only have a hundred, man, is that gonna feel like a very different special event? And that's a good thing, I think. I have uh, from one of our clients uh, a question. Sure. The need of audience is different in person versus via virtual. How do you meet those two sets of needs with virtual? With virtual, you mean, yeah. Um, well, I'd love to hear a little bit more in terms of what the needs are. So for example, in virtual, you're right. It's probably more, um, it's rapid fire. They want personal information. They wanna be able to write it down. They don't want it to be too long. Versus in person, it's more about collaboration and listening and you have time to thought and process. I guess what they both need, right, is some form of collaboration. And they do both need to be able to take some key takeaways. So those to me are just agnostic. But beyond that, we just have to make sure that the Sorry, my dog. The virtual meetings, the people could perhaps drop off. One of the things I've done is have the virtual people drop off and then I save a little bit more for the interactivity for people in person. I actually love it that your dog's whining. I was yeah. on a, a call with uh, Patrick Lencioni and Jim Collins. And oh. here, these are these two, you know, big thought leaders and they're like, listen leaders, you have got to show the human side. When you have people that are struggling with their three-year-old that's wanting to hop up in their lap, you know, the dog is going to bark. The cat is going to walk across the back of the chair. That's normalizing. So yeah. it's normal. And that's great. It's, it's, uh, it's the human experience we're all in together. Fantastic. Well, this has been fantastic. You're always Thank a you. of energy. Uh, she has another tool, which is one of my favorites. And it's like, oh, here it is. I have to keep it on my desk. It is 40 <laughs> amazing ways to say no. A time to stop wasting time on unnecessary things and take your time back. So, you know what, Gail, if you want, this. well, let's do this. Let's give it to everybody that was here today. So we'll send it to you and then you can send it out to everyone. And that, as long as they share with you the ways, well, hopefully they'll say yes. To
to you, but that they say, no, it works. That's fantastic. I'll send it over. That's great. Okay, that would be great. And for <laughs> any of you that have joined us today, I can see some of my friends who, uh, I know Elaine's on here uh, from SP Richards who you've spoken to in the past. And so for, for anyone though that is interested in exploring doing something with Lisa, give us a call. Uh, the one thing about virtual, people are creating meetings they didn't even know they wanted to have. And they're doing them on a very short time window. So if you need help and you think Lisa's a fit, give us a call. Thanks, everybody. I hope you learned something. Gail, you're awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks, everyone.